thank you, Douglas and Gwen and uh, Vanessa, Ram, and, and everyone at Scripps who have worked to make the uh, uh, not just this technical forum, but all the other technical forums happen and make them possible. I just really uh, thank you. Appreciate the work you guys do. Um, uh, as was introduced, my name is David Velasco, and I'm a principal program manager here at Nortex New uh, Vela uh, Velocimeter Center of Excellence, which is just up the street from Scripps here in uh, uh, sunny Del Mar. Uh, now, today I'll be talking to you about the expanding research capabilities with advanced multifunctional uh, Doppler systems. So let's get started. Now, just a, a uh, you know, in, in the presentation, I was just talking to Douglas right now, um, you know, in the abstract, once I actually put that together and then you start working on a presentation and you find a lot of the other cool things that, you know, people like to do uh, with our systems and then so sort of change things around a little bit. Um, but this is an overview here in the agenda, what we'll be covering today. And I'll start with a brief description of Nortec, uh, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with us, and then make a point about why multifunctional systems are really important. Uh, then I'm gonna to move to cover uh, these systems and show you some of the cool things that people have done uh, with them. Now, today we have a, a quite small and, and but very eclectic group of, of users for everything from some very advanced uh, experienced users, uh, as well as some with minimum to no experience with ADCP. So I'll, I'll try to keep everybody uh, engaged as best as I can and also uh, learn from each other as well, hopefully. Uh, now, some parts, so some parts of this presentation uh, are gonna be more interesting to one group uh, than to others. So I just ask you bear with us as, as we go along. Um, I'm also going to pause the presentation a couple of times uh, during the presentation and open up for any uh, questions that people might have up and through that point in the presentation. Um, and of course, open up at the very end for a more formal and traditional uh, Q&A session as well. Okay. So here is a, uh, a very a brief summary of what Nortec is about. So Nortec, they, we make advanced um, uh, instruments to measure movement uh, of water or uh, movement underwater. Similar to sort of sonar in technology, but we use the echoes uh, as a uh, to measure the water velocity, the movement of that water. Now, these systems are commonly called ADCPs or acoustic Doppler current profilers, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, at Nortec, um, our products, they cover everything from uh, velocimeters, which um, is here in our new development center, uh, which we focus on, which are single point systems. Um, we then also manufacture profilers, um, we manufacture wave systems, uh, Doppler velocity logs or DVLs, which are used for underwater navigation. Um, most recent addition to the family is the Nortec Echo, which is a uh, uh, entry level, low cost, uh, miniaturized ADCP uh, that can be used for you know, educational purposes um, uh, and a variety of different purposes as well, about the size of a, a can of Coke really. And uh, finally, but definitely not least, and this is will be the focus of my presentation today, is our, what we call our signature series uh, systems, which are uh, multifunctional type of uh, type of ADCPs. Now, Nortec has nine um, subsidiaries around the world. We are headquarters in Norway, just outside of Oslo. Uh, and throughout our subsidiaries, we do product um, uh, sales and support and some development as well. And the latest addition to the family is our office here in Del Mar that we just opened up uh, recently, where we'll be doing advanced product development. Now, again, starting to get a little bit more into the meat of the presentation. So why we make multifunctional ADCP systems. Now, you might have heard of this acronym related to product development, it's called SWAP, which stands for size, weight, and power. And basically what it is that it means that we want things that are smaller, lighter, and that can last a long time on a charge, you know, not unlike, you know, mobile phones that we have, right? Now, another way people have described this is that you want something that's you know, faster, smaller, cheaper, right? Which then introduces a price component into the equation as well. Um, but the reality is that when we're talking about system development, advanced underwater system development at that, um, 
you only get to pick two out of the three options in what is commonly uh, known as the product development golden triangle, which is what I kind of uh, shown here on the screen. But, and you probably, I'm sure you've seen this before, but in, and you get the point, right? If you basically, if you want something that is good and cheap, it's gonna take a long time to do. If you want something that's fast and good, it's gonna be expensive and so forth. And of course, if you want something that's good, fast and cheap, then, you know, as the slide says, you're, you know, your dream and it's just not possible. However, and this is where I think is the, the core here of, of the point we're trying to make is that, what if you can do more than one thing with the system? And then perhaps that allows us to expand this good uh, circle, if you will, and then maybe not make all of the dream a reality, but some parts of the dream become a, a reality as well. And that's from an oceanographic researcher's perspective, this means more multi and cross-discipline collaboration and a significantly greater uh, flexibility in what you, you know, in what you can achieve, which goes back to what that initial title that Douglas was where it was mentioned about grabbing that funding, right? You know, if funding agencies today, if you just say, well, I want to do this one thing and one thing only, um, you know, chances of success get diminished. Uh, if you can collaborate and expand and bring other aspects into it, uh, then of course uh, uh, your chances of, of funding are improved. So you now, as I mentioned, I'll be focusing on the signature series here, from here on out in the presentation. And this is the a family that uh, uh, the how the signature series family is is uh, established today. These five systems. Now, the systems are shown here uh, on the slide to scale from left to right in decrease in frequency, and with the number after their name is actually the frequency of the instrument in kilohertz. So, for example, right in the middle where the signature 250 is. Uh, as an example, that means that the nominal frequency of that instrument is 250 kilohertz. Uh, the second line below the name of the instrument is the maximum sampling rate for each of those systems, and the uh, followed below that by the uh, nominal maximum profiling range for each of those. So as you can see, as you go lower in the frequency from left to right, the instrument gets physically larger its sampling rate decreases, but the profiling range increases as well. And I would also add the resolution, uh, spatial and temporal, or, or temporal, of course, here, but spatial resolution also uh, decreases as you go you know, to lower frequencies. Uh, now, so here I have a uh, partial list of the technical cap capabilities that the signature series brings. Um, Part of this is actually a patent. Uh, so if you go to Google and type up that patent number there, you get all of the boring patent uh, legalese uh, details on it. Um, of course, we don't have time to cover all of these over here, but I'm gonna try to focus on these uh, top five ones here that I have identified with these arrows. So now I'm gonna move the rest of the presentation talking about uh, these. Uh, as I go along, I will introduce the pertinent technology, um, but then I also present an example of the of that technology. Uh, but we need to first set the stage here by first talking about the concurrent mode technology, um, because it is inherent. This technology is, is in, it not only is what described in that patent, but is also it is inherent in, uh, inherent to the multifunctional capabilities of the signature series. And in short, what we mean by concurrent uh, mode is that we, uh, what, what it means is that we split a, each one second interval in time into a series of slots. Uh, and within each of them, we can transmit a particular type of ping or a pulse out of the instrument. Uh, in the case of the signature 1000, which is the highest frequency that we have shown here, it's illustrated on the, on the uh, right side of the slide. Uh, it has a sampling rate of up to 16 Hertz and therefore we have up to 16 slots within that one second period. Uh, I'm also listing below the slide, the different types of pings that you can send. Um, and of course, each of these pings would do something differently, um, you know, for, for uh, you know, that the system, some different capability that the system can do. Now, of course, there are practical and physical limitations of what can be done, uh, especially given that these pings cannot be fired on the slanted transducers of the slot or of the uh, beam in the vertical at the same time. You know? So you cannot fit more than one ping type in one slot. It's just not physical, physically possible. Um, 
but the amount of flexibility is still uh, unprecedented, unprecedented with these systems and, and of course supports a very wide range of applications. So I'm going to pause. This is going to be my first pause in the presentation here and see if there has been any um, questions that uh, anybody has up until this stage uh, of the presentation. So uh, I'll leave that, I guess, to Douglas or whoever to unmute people as needed. Or if there are any questions in the chat, I'll be ha happy to address them now. I haven't seen any questions come through in the Q&A, and I don't see any hands raised at the present time. OK. That means that everybody is understanding everything, which is great. Um, OK, so I will uh, proceed then uh, to move forward with this. And so as uh, going forward here, what I'll be doing is showing examples of what some researchers have done with these technologies that we have uh, embedded in part of the signature series here. Uh, now, I chose to organize this by users, and you have here um, uh, you know, and then followed that by the technology rather than the other way around is, is most often done. Because I, I think that's a more interesting way to presenting the topic. Um, so uh, I'm start with you know, the three or actually four different organizations here that I'll be highlighting are University of Washington's uh, Applied Physics Lab. Of course, you know, being here in the hometown, I can't leave scripts out, uh, which would be the second organization I'll be highlighting there. And then um, finally, we'll be talking about uh, or some work that we have done with the uh, French National Research Agency, CNRS, as well as uh, also here in San Diego, NOAA's uh, Southwest Fishery Science Center. Uh, some of the user technology uh, common or the user technology combinations here that I'm going to highlight, um, they just use or one primary aspect of the technology or maybe two. Others take advantage of multiple aspects of what the signature series uh, can offer. Um, so let's move forward. Um, so the first one, first technical capability that I'd like to highlight here is how the signature series offer by far the lowest Doppler noise of any ADCP that's out there. And I'm using this reference here. There's this paper by uh, uh, Mari Carmen Ge uh, Geha and uh, Jim Thompson over at, at University of Washington's APL to illustrate this point. Um, you suggest again all of the references that I, I mentioned here. Uh, you know, I suggest you guys look these up after the uh, uh, most of these are, are open, so you can you can download it uh, freely. Um, but what they did here in this particular example is a multi ADCP comparison at two high energy sites uh, in the Puget Sound in Washington State, uh, and I'll be showing next a figure from their paper, um, and it's from this. Uh, top site right here, which is um, what's called Admiralty Inlet, uh, right in the entrance or the northern end there of, uh, of Puget Sound. So now those who are not familiar with uh, ADCPs, the concept of Doppler noise is essential for anyone who's working with turbulent uh, flow. Uh, Doppler noise, uh, uh, that topic itself is a presentation all on its own. It's, you know, you can write, you know, more than one paper just on that topic alone. So we don't have time to cover and to go into some of these details. But you can think of the Doppler noise um, as an ADCP's ability to detect very minute fluctuations in the flow field, really go down to like how, how, low, can you, how low can you go, so to speak. Um, in how true that velocity really is. Now, a common way to visualize um, this is via uh, spectral plots of total kinetic energy, which is, uh, you know, we plot, normally plot that on the y-axis, and then that shows the amount of energy in each frequency band, which is on the x-axis, like the plots that I showed here on the slide. Um, these ones here are particular for uh, that site that I showed in a previous slide and are just for the horizontal components of the velocity at a particular depth, in this case, I believe around 10 meters uh, above the bottom. Um, the purpose of there was, of course, they were trying to look at um, uh, uh, hub height of hydrokinetic energy uh, turbines. Uh, now the colors in the plot, they mean the, the flow, the, or they indicate the flow uh, mean flow speed, 
And the primary characteristics of the plots like this is the place where the curves flatten out towards the lower right of each plot. So you see this section here where they kind of uh, uh, flatten out here uh, as well as here, over here as well. And this is where when we make these plots, this is what we're, we're looking for look, or, or going after. Um, this is where this, these plots flatten out. This is where, what it means is that the, uh, uh, the data really has reached the noise level of the instrument. And therefore it really determines that the ultimate detection capability, if you will, uh, of the instrument itself. Now in, the, in, in this particular case, it means that turbulent components uh, on this particular flow that have a frequency that are higher than about one to two Hertz um, or spectral energy less than about 10 to the minus four uh, cannot be detected. And so you want that flattening out to be as low as possible and to the farthest right on the graph as, as you can get. Uh, you're also gonna see some uh, two other features on both of these graphs. And again, more discussion on this is available in that reference that I, I mentioned. Um, but one is a pink region, uh, which is a, a superimposed series of lines in uh, with a, a, the dashed red line is, is the mean of all of those values. And what this is, is data uh, from the exact same site, but from one of our Nortec vector velocimeters, uh, which is a single point, very small sampling volume type of instrument. Uh, not only is this very small sampling volume, uh, you know, sort of about two cubic centimeters or so, uh, but it also samples significantly faster, uh, rates of up to 64 Hertz. Um, that means that inherently it's going to have a lower uh, uh, Doppler noise than any type of ADSP or profiling system out there. However, as I mentioned, it's not a profiling instrument. It is a single point instrument. So you cannot do things at multiple levels. And so, but it's also good to see how the flattening of the curve here that we see in these plots from the ADCP, they're, they're, they're not, obviously not at the same level as the velocimeter, but they're not that far off either. Um, and so that you know, means that you know, we're, they're somewhat close together, which is, which is definitely what we want. Um, finally, final note on, on this particular slide is that there's a, uh, you also see a set of gray lines that are sort of the same data, but from another type of ADCP. Um, but again, you can learn more about that in the, in the paper itself. Uh, but the point here is that it has a much higher uh, noise level uh, threshold there uh, when compared to the signature series ADCPs. Um, so again, the point here again is, is that the signature series ADCPs really have a very low noise, which makes them ideal for, for turbulent flow uh, conditions. Um, okay, so now we have already talked about you know, concurrent measurement. Uh, fast sampling rate is, is just as it sounds, means that it samples very fast. Uh, but motion correction, uh, before we go into this, I need to give a bit of an introduction to this so that we know what I know we're all on the same page here. Um, so now all ADCPs in the world, they use tilt and, and actually heading data as well to compute earth reference velocity, you know, east, north, and up, um, so that you know, they're more meaningful to us. Uh, now in ADCPs, uh, tilt or the inclination of the instrument, right, from once, uh, is actually historically been measured by three actors, certainly over the last 10 years or more have been measured by three axis accelerometers. Now three axis accelerometers, um, they are great sensors um, and they're embedded as part of practically all ADCPs out there, but they respond to all accelerations, not just acceleration due to gravity. So you cannot differentiate between what we call static tilt and dynamic tilt. Um, so to understand the difference in between these two, so then we can then move forward and talk about how this is important and how this adds to the research capability that Signature Series brings, we have to talk just a little bit about the um, uh, motion correction aspect in here. And so the, um, uh, what we have is that most ADCPs, they make the assumption that uh, the flow along each beam is moving at the same, uh, basically is doing the same thing. Um, if there is tilt in the instrument, the cells, the location of these move up and down the water column, which then creates a smearing effect on the data. 
Uh, and if there is shear in the, the, in the velocity profile as well, then we are uh, uh, essentially causing, also in, uh, adding a biasing effect on this. And so a three axis accelerometer tilt can generate a large source, large errors in this tilt because it's responding to these accelerations as well. They're not just gravity. And some of these errors can be, you know, 20, 30, even more uh, degrees which if you use that to then adjust what the position of these cells are, you end up with uh, very incorrect locations in the water column. So the solution that we have added to the signature series is the addition of what we call an AHRS or an attitude and heading reference system. And that means essentially that in addition to three axis accelerometer, we're also adding a three axis uh, rotational rate sensor or a gyro to it. So going back now, we have a better understanding of, of motion compensation. I'm listing another reference here that describes a, a surface drift and buoy called the SWIFT. Um, uh, this uh, that uses a signature 1000 system for current and turbulence measurements in the open ocean. And I encourage you not only to get the reference that I have listed over here, but also to view their website as well, which I think uh, has been posted on the chat as well. Uh, so basically, they toss this buoy and, and let it drift around, and some of the data they get is shown here on the plot on the, uh, on the center of the slide, which is uh, turbulent dissipation rate with depth uh, versus depth, which you can think of, of this as the environment's ability to dissipate energy, which is, again, a critical uh, component to study. Uh, the blue lines on the top of the graph are from an earlier version of the Swift uh, Drifter, uh, while the red lines are from the present version, uh, which has a signature. 1000 ADCP. The concurrent aspect here is that the signature 1000 is operating both in traditional broadband current profile mode, but it's also using a special high resolution mode at the same time, which then provides them both with mean currents as well as turbulence uh, statistics. And of course, they're doing this at high rates of, of this case of to eight Hertz, bringing in that fast sampling rate uh, of the instrument also to, to the equation. Um, now coming a little bit closer to home here, I'm going to show an example from a group uh, at Scripps uh, that is led by Dr. Drew Lucas, Rob Pinkle, and, and uh, among many others, uh, where we talk about the data from the Signature 1000 that is mounted on the uh, Wirewalker uh, profiling platform, which is the platform that I'm shown here on the left on the, on the slide. Uh, again, I would encourage you to visit the, uh, the Delmar Oceanographics website which is the local company here responsible for, the, for making the Wirewalker. And you can learn more, more about the actual operating principles of the Wirewalker. But basically it's a profiling platform that uses wave energy to move up and down the water column, creating extraordinary uh, detail of data in the ocean's top 100 to even 500 meters or so. Uh, it is a payload carrying platform. And so you can put CTDs, you can put a number of other sensors on it. Uh, and that allows, again, the movement of those sensors up and down the water column for profiling. Uh, the reference that I'm citing here uh, is still in preparation, uh, but Drew and, and his PhD student, uh, Bo Fu Zhang, uh, were gracious enough to let me use this plot uh, from their upcoming paper. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to draw your attention here is the velocity data and the shear that's shown on the bottom two plots. Uh, and, and again, these came from the signature uh, 1000 data that's, that's on, the, uh, uh, on the wire walker. Now the level of detail that they have here uh, captures just, is just amazing. Uh, and the, uh, uh, not a thousand, but a hundred meter range over which they do it, it's, it's really may only possible because the signature 1000 is sampling very fast at 16 Hertz continuously here. Uh, and in high resolution mode. Uh, and these velocities are also motion corrected uh, with the signature 1000s embedded um, AHRS, uh, which again, which is what allows them to be, these velocities to be so clean uh, in such high resolution over such a great range uh, uh, of depth, which is really uh, unprecedented here. Uh, the paper will talk about the algorithm that they have developed to do these, these transformations and these compensations, um, which again, it made possible by these, all of these features that the signature series brings. 
um, uh, just as a point of reference here, which I think is, is really cool, the, uh, the black lines in this are the isopycnose, and I think it's really cool to see, especially it really comes out on the shear, how you know these features really follow the density gradients in the flow. And again, at this level of detail, you couldn't see this in, in any other way. So I'm gonna, uh, this is my second pause here. Um, I'm going to, again, just take a brief pause and see if there are any questions that people have or that they wanted to, to discuss up until this time. Uh, we have no questions or hands raised at this time. Okay. Either I'm doing a really good job or everybody's asleep or, <laughs> or, or a little bit of both, so we'll see. Um, all right, so let's, let's move forward here. Um, so now I'm actually entering now the, the last section of the presentation where I'm going to switch gears a little bit and focus uh, less on turbulence and small scale uh, uh, velocity phenomena, but also going to, but now I'm going to be talking a little bit more about these longer range systems and also talk more about biology than physics. Although I have to preempt with saying that I'm not a biologist or a fisheries expert. And so for me, it is you know, uh, I hope if there is one on the crowd, uh, definitely do correct me for, you know, if I say something that, it, you know, it's not correct. So, um, so now one of the sampling capabilities that we've added to the signature series is the ability to send a scientific echo sound and pulse. Now, what that means is essentially it's a very short pulse, you know, just uh, often a millisecond or less, uh, very short or up to six milliseconds. Um, but it has a very high dynamic range and it allows us to image things in the water column in extraordinary detail. Uh, now this is supported in the vertical beams, uh, which is the center beam of those systems, uh, both in the signature uh, 1500, as well as the signature 100. Um, and this latter system signature 100 actually has a dedicated multi-frequency transducer with two different pulse types. Um, this is the, and this is the type of the image that you get out of this mode. Um, and on the left here, what you see is actually three days of data from about 250 meters of system deployed at about 250 meters, I should say, uh, in water depth, just off of here in San Diego, if you just hold, head straight out of, of Mission Bay, uh, and then until you get to about 300 meters of water. And the, uh, uh, what you, the, the three patterns that you see there, the deal, uh, zooplankton migration, these are very clearly observed. You see basically their movement upwards towards the surface. And then later on in the day, this is during nighttime. And then during the day, they come down towards the bottom and then they repeat the sequence over here. Um, but in addition to this, you also see other really cool things. You see, for example, here in the middle, let me get my mouse correct. Um, here in the middle, you see some internal wave structures. You see what is likely to be some uh, schools of fish and other features as well as part of this. Uh, so again, extraordinary level of detail that you couldn't get from, from, uh, from an, any other type of, of, uh, of system. On the right-hand side, this is actually from a signature 1000 uh, deployed in the uh, Maldives uh, or Maldives, I'm not sure how to proper pronunciation, but uh, what you're seeing here are actually manta rays that are actually flying over the uh, signature 1000. So they're, they're, you can, you know, some of them you can al almost tell that is actually a manta ray just by the, uh, just by the shape of the, uh, of the reflection. Uh, now keep in mind that at the same time we're doing this, the system is also, you know, we do all these cool imaging of the water, what's in the water column. We're also profiling currents. And we're also doing anything else that the instrument can physically do. So all of that is happening all at the same time. Um, now here, this is, this is an example from a paper that I'm presently working on. And we presented at the, uh, the Oceans Conference, uh, which is happening here in San Diego uh, later in September this year. Hopefully, you know, we'll see some of you guys over there. Um, and it focused on the work that we're doing uh, together with the French National Research Agency, um, uh, as well um, as the Australian software company, EchoView. 
which is a global leader in echo sounder data processing. Now, we use the EchoView software to do some advanced processing of the echo sounder data according to, again, very established methods that are used in, in fisheries research. Uh, in this particular case, you see this is the uh, location of uh, what they call the albatross mooring, which has a bunch of other equipment on it. And the, we had a signature 100 deployed at the top of the mooring in about 370 meters, 380 meters of water depth. Uh, the total site depth here is about 2,500 meters. Um, so it's at the top profiling, looking upwards towards the surface. Uh, and again, the location here is in the, just off of the coast of Southern France. Um, so the, um, what I'm showing here in this slide um, is on the top two graphs are, and uh, you guys are the first ones to see these, uh, uh, what are shown here in these graphs are data from the uh, slanted beams, which again are the ones responsible for the velocity measuring. And the top graph shows what we call signal correlation, which is a, a general measure of, of velocity data validity. Uh, and the uh, bottom graph, or I say the middle graph, is the strength of the acoustic pulse or, or the signal amplitude, again, from the slanted beams. Now, what you see is that during daylight hours, the water in the Mediterranean is so void of scatters, it is so clear that the instrument's profiling range is significantly reduced. So you see a lot of sort of sections in the water that are, are white, basically that have been filtered out because there's not enough difference between you know, the, uh, uh, the water itself and the things that we're trying to, or the pulse will reflect off in the water. Uh, if you've been in the Mediterranean, you probably see the water is pretty pretty clear over there. Uh, now, this is common in many, you know, uh, Antarctic and uh, Arctic waters are, are common like that, actually not as bad. Um, but it's especially true in the Mediterranean um, for various reasons, but one of them, of course, is the, the lack of, of major riverine input into the sea. Um, and so uh, that, that, you know, is suspended in, in, in the water column. You know, everything that comes down in the Nile, of course, is in the far uh, east of the sea, and it, most of it, it just goes to the deep ocean there, or the deep uh, med. Um, so the Mediterranean is a very challenging place, which you know for ADCPs, which is a good testing place for ADCPs as well, especially for longer range systems. Um, but the cool part really here is the biology, which is on the bottom most uh, panel here. Um, this is the echogram that has been completely processed. Um, and uh, what we see is uh, how, again, I mentioned that most of the water is mostly void of scatters during the day. Uh, the zooplankton moves down the water column during the day. You can see, try to, you can see these movements over here, and then it moves up during the night. But then they're also, you know, try to hang over with the, over at the near the surface as well. Um, and um, you know, so the echogram together with the currents, which I'm not showing here, allows to a very detailed view of this behavior. And of course, its impact on the ADCP profiling range as well. Um, I'm going to take in a closer look at the one 24 hour cycle here of this data set. And we can see how there appears to be more than one species involved in the migration. In the migration uh, and they move at different times. You can see sort of two distinct uh, uh, downward movement lines here, and certainly two distinct upper movement uh, lines uh, as well as over here. Um, again, I'm not a, uh, a biologist or, or, or fishery scientist, so I don't know what exactly that means, um, but it seems to me that, again, two different species here. We definitely, we also see um, schools of fish, you know, over here clearly, over here as well, and up towards the surface that, um, uh, seem to uh, dissipate after the zooplankton moves down, uh, which again further confirms that uh, going fishing around dusk and dawn, as it's normally done, is definitely the best time to go fishing. Uh, during the day, we also see larger and more sparsely spread animals, um, even some individuals you can see over here. And for those of a bit of a teaser, for those of you who will be at the presentation in, in the Oceans Conference, we'll get to see more, more details in this. Um, but they seem to be hanging around within short range of the instrument, which further creates difficulties for the profiling range, which uh, especially if this, uh, these are swim bladder fish, because they're definitely you know, a, a, around the, the top of the instrument. 
mixed with air pockets, which is not what uh, which is which is good for acoustics. Um, now, this migration is so large. In fact, the, uh, the zooplankton migration in the world's oceans is the largest animal migration on Earth by far in terms of biomass. Uh, and they actually impact the currents. Uh, and here I'm plotting the vertical velocity as measured by the signature uh, 100 ABCP. And it's very clear to see that the zooplankton start their migration upward just prior to sunset. Um, as you can see over here, the, the yellow here is just prior to the sunset time and downward just prior to sunrise. So basically, uh, they, you know, by the time the sun has risen or has set that their migration is complete, which is not the same pattern you observe. If you look into this in more detail, it's not the same pattern you observe in other um, uh, oceans. Um, speeds here. Um, can reach in, you know, some of it's actually up to eight centimeters per second moving upward and slightly downward about four or five centimeters per second moving, uh, or sorry, eight centimeters per second moving up and about four to five moving down. So again, it's it's quite a large in, um, movement and these, has, these have in direct implication to carbon cycling, for example, because they're transporting nutrients up and down the water column as they do this every day, twice a day. Um, this is the last slide here. We've been speaking here for about a little over 30 minutes. And, and so this is my last slide. And this is a uh, reference from uh, right here in, in, you know, in town as well, NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center. And they're, they were uh, looking at uh, something that they do on an annual basis, looking at Antarctic krill population. And they have done this uh, again, every year, but specifically now they have switched to using mooring systems with the signature 100 on the mooring instead of vessel mounted systems. Now, uh, they did this uh, a couple of years ago, actually, yeah, a couple of years ago and, and every year and, and since then. Uh, in this particular research, they were taught they had six separate moorings that are, are representative by these black dots here on and just off the northern tip of the Ant Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and what you see on the left uh, is the echogram, which again shows a similar behavior to what I showed in my last slide, you know, with, with the biology moving upwards in the water column uh, around sunset. And then at, uh, when sunrise, they move down. Now, of course, the length of the day and, and the rate of movement is significantly different, different because again, you're not talking, it's a completely different environment, but you see the, the same behavior. Um, you also see there are certainly three very clear populations here with the krill, which is what they are interested in really hanging around towards the surface most of the time uh, with then some uh, fish or likely squid, maybe some, and, and you can even image some of the individuals over here and some other type of reflector here that, you know, they're not even sure what it is, which is, you know, kind of interesting. Um, now on the right side, because the instrument is not only measuring this, uh, uh, you know, all of this biomass, but it's also measuring currents, they can calculate advective volume transport for the krill, uh, which is shown here, which is all those red blobs sort of moving from the red points, which, you know, again, I'm showing that the currents coming out in this direction over here. Um, and, and this is over a one, one week period. Now, this is a key tool that and NOAA and, and other agencies monitor and help to regulate the industry fisheries, uh, uh, provide data for the regulation of the fisheries uh, industry in this particular region. And um, I think that's it. So just gonna wrap it up. But again, the, you know, we have in our tech, we have a, a very established um, uh, performance record of making very high quality and high precision instrumentation and the signature series really provides a um, you know a very powerful platform for a wide range of research applications and and hopefully we can use that you can use that to achieve some of your scientific uh, goals and that's all I had for today um, this is my uh, email contact here at the end and I really want it again Thanks, uh, thank everyone there for the uh, participation and hopefully this was helpful to, to all of you guys.
Thank you, Dave. I just wanted to, to there weren't any uh, new questions, but we had some that came in um, via the RSVP form um, that we had people fill out beforehand. And um, uh, I think one of them you probably covered, which is what's new in ADCPs. Um, uh, second was how can ADCPs be used from uh, USVs? Um, and uh, the third is how can this technology be used to study tetrapods or other top predators? Okay, um, in terms of um, USVs so, or, or unmanned surface vehicles, um, this is generally not, not that different from uh, the drifting platform that I showed here, the Swift or, or a little less than in, in, in the, the Wirewalker because the Wirewalk is actually profiling. But you know, for USBs, it can definitely, absolutely can be used. Um, there's actually a, an additional benefit that I did not mention in the presentation, just again, just for time purposes, is that one of the pulse types that uh, the signature series can send, if I go back to some of those slides I talked about here, um, is what we call the bottom tracking pain. And what that is, is that it, uh, if you are within range of the bottom for the instrument, it allows you to track the movement of the vehicle over the, over the bottom, which then can be used to subtract the vehicle's speed and come up with just the velocity of the vehicle. So yes, I mean, um, signature series products are widely used in a number of different um, uh, USBs out there, uh, as well as even gliders, so definitely uh, for sure. Um, in terms of tetrapods, um, again, I'm not a biologist, but I'm assuming you're talking about underwater tetrapods or, 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 or things, things of that sort. Um, whoever asked the question maybe can, can um, uh, clarify that for us. But as long as, as the acoustic impedance of whatever it is you're trying to image is significantly uh, large compared to the surrounding water, then yes, the system uh, can certainly detect it. Um, I think in terms of larger animals of that type, I think probably the biggest limitation or, or issue in terms of using ADCPs is that, of course, the, uh, whatever the creature is, it needs to cross the path, the beam path of the instrument. And uh, you would definitely want to stick with the higher frequency types of systems. Um, and, um, you know, we can place it in such a way that you can, you know, the, the, the species is likely to, to cross the, that path of that beam. So hopefully that addresses that question. But uh, if not, whoever asked, uh, either, you know, raise your hand or, or um, uh, feel free to reach out to me at, uh, afterwards. Great. Well, I think that is uh, all we had. So I want to thank you again for this great presentation today. Oh, I actually had one question is, you talked about adding the APRS to um, the ADCPs. And I just wondered how that impacted the, uh, the power and battery performance. Right, right. Actually, it's quite minimum. You're, you're looking at, you know, uh, uh, you know, thanks to things like this, you know, cell phones, the technology has advanced so much in the last, I mean, 10 to even five years that not only the size has come down significantly in price, but also their power consumption. I mean, these used to be big devices that would have to go external to the instrument, synchronize, you know, synchronization was an issue and power. And, and of course, price, they're all, some of these are more expensive than the ADCP itself. Um, but in short, we're looking at anywhere between three to 5% increase in power consumption when you're looking at, when you, you add these capabilities. Um, and of course, because you're adding more components because re we record also the raw all of the raw magnetometer, three axis magnetometer, three axis accelerometer, and three axis gyro output at whatever rate that you're sampling. So if you don't have 16 Hertz, like the guys at, you know, Del Mar Ocean or Oceanographics are doing with the, uh, with the wire walker, if you're doing in, in like that, you're also generating a lot more data. Now, memory is significantly less of a concern nowadays. I mean, you have you know, uh, 128 gigabyte recorders now on a lot of the, these instruments. And so that's not a concern, but power, you're looking at anywhere between three to 5% more when you turn them on. Well, oh, thanks for that info. Sure. Well, thank you again. And uh, um, 
really gave some great information and, and some unique uses of uh, ADCPs. Right. right. Awesome one. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, and so just to the, the those that are still here, on July 30th, we'll have Blue Robotics. On August 9th, uh, Sontech. And on August 23rd, Kongsberg will be uh, giving presentations. But thank you today. Great. Thanks, everybody. Take care.